Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Ayman Nazir and welcome back to Knowledge Realm. Today we are going to study a very interesting, important and a little saddening topic that is downfall of Muslim rule in India and colonization by British. In the last lecture we studied how Mughals came to subcontinent and how they established their magnificent empire and how they ruled from 1526 to 1857. Although the fragmentation and weakening of Mughal Empire had already started before 1857, it had already started right after the death of Aurangzeb Alamgir, but the final crunch to the Mughal Empire took place in 1857 when the locals stood up and fought war of independence. So today we are going to study this entire time period that is from 1707 to 1857. We would study in much detail the arrival of British in India and the war of independence also. So it's going to be very interesting and uh, let's get started. So we would divide this huge topic that is downfall of Muslim rule in India in three subtopics. First we would study the downfall of Mughal Empire in India. How the Mughal Empire weakened, how it fragmented and how it was destroyed completely. Then we would study the arrival and rule of British in India and uh, it was the prime reason behind the downfall of Muslim rule or we can say behind the downfall of Mughal rule also. Then we would study War of Independence 1857. That was the final crunch to Muslim rule in India. So we're going to study all this in much detail. So we would start with downfall of Mughal Empire. The downfall of Mughal Empire actually started right after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. The factors and the events that led to the downfall of Mughal Empire are enlisted here. First of all, it was the Aurangzeb's rule itself that caused the downfall of Mughal Empire, that caused the weakening of Mughal Empire. Aurangzeb's staunch personality has a strict policies against non-Muslim disintegrated people. And then the non-Muslims revolted against Aurangzeb. They started setting their own empire, they started fighting with the Muslim rulers and they established an empire named Maratha Empire. In 1680. Then the empire was not only weakened from within but from without also. Persians started invading and they started fighting wars. Then another reason behind the weakening of Mughal Empire was the lack of worthy and competent rulers after Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb who was guilty of his past did not train competent rulers did not train his next generation so that they could rule such a magnificent empire. So after the death of Aurangzeb, the empire was in hands of incompetent people. It caused disintegration among people. It fragmented the empire. Then the arrival of British in 1614. It was one of the prime reason behind the downfall of Mughal Empire. Then the final reason was the war of independence that was fought by the locals in 1857. So these were all the factors and in the next slides we would study all these factors in much detail. Let's study the Aurangzeb's rule that agitated non-Muslims in detail. Aurangzeb was actually a staunch Muslim and he adopted very strict policies against non-Muslims. He adopted such policies that were not even advised by the Islam. I mean we all know that Islam advises Muslim rulers, Muslim emperor to be fair with the non-Muslim minority of the empire. But Aurangzeb did not follow Islam in this matter. In fact he adopted very strict policies against non-Muslims. He banned their Persian festival named Noros and he appointed Mohtasibs. Now what these Mohtasibs are? Mohtasibs actually the people appointed by the government to take care that people in the empire follow Islamic teachings in their everyday life 
and in their businesses and in the trade and everything. They were given this responsibility. So it created a very tense environment. He imposed heavy jizya on non-Muslims that agitated non-Muslims. He crushed temples of Hindus that caused great hatred in the hearts of Hindus for Aurangzeb. His policies actually created disunity among people of diverse ethnicity. So this was the rule of Aurangzeb that started the disintegration, disunity among the people and weakening of Mughal Empire. So the seeds of hatred and disunity had already been sown by Aurangzeb in his life, in his rule. And after his death, the weakening and fragmentation got intensified. And after his death, revolts started. So the first nation that revolted against Mughal Empire was Maratha. They started fighting under the leadership of a leader uh, named Shivaji Maharaja and they started launching wars against Mughal Empire. It was Mughal Maratha War. And in 1674, they took over the Kan Peninsula. Then, Ahmad Shah Abdali in the Third Battle of Panipat in 1761 crushed Maratha to save the Mughal Empire. Then, taking advantage of chaos, Juts of Delhi, Mathura and Agra raised their heads because they also wanted to get rid of Mughals because they, they had intense hatred against Mughals just because of the rule of Aurangzeb, unfair rule of Aurangzeb. Then in 1669, Juts launched their first revolt against Mughal Empire. So this was all the consequences of the rule of Aurangzeb, that people, I mean non-Muslims, started revolting after the death of Aurangzeb and it weakened Mughal Empire. In addition to internal disintegration and internal insurgencies, External invasions were also there to weaken the Mughal Empire. In 1738, Nadir Shah of Afshad Dynasty invaded India. He actually wanted to settle some old scores with Mughal Empire, so he launched attack after the death of Aurangzeb. Those of you who are student of international relations might have an idea that in international relations, friendships and rivalries are not constant. So at that time, Persia was a rival to Mughal Empire. So Nadir Shah launched an attack. And in 1738 to 1739, he fought Battle of Karnal with Muhammad Shah of Mughal Empire. History shows that the invasion of Nadir Shah was one of the heinous, one of the gruesome invasions of the history of India. He massacred Delhi and killed 30,000 innocent citizens. He looted wealth of Mughal Empire and did irretrievable damage to Mughal Empire. So this was the invasion of India by Nadir Shah that weakened Mughal Empire. So another reason behind the weakening of Mughal Empire was the incompetency of rulers after Aurangzeb. After Aurangzeb, Mughal rulers fell in dissipation and they were not interested in keeping the empire consolidated. And once again, we can blame this on Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb actually never trained any of his offsprings, his next generation, to rule the empire. He never trained his people. Why? Because he was guilty Ganshan. He was guilty of his past. He knew that he was a good warrior. What he did to his brothers, what he did to his father. So he was guilty inside and he never trained any of his offsprings to be a good warrior. So this is the reasons that right after Aurangzeb, Mughal rulers were not good and they were incompetent. Aurangzeb was succeeded by Muhammad Azam Shah, who was defeated by his brother Bahadur Shah I, and these people were just indulged in luxuries and started fighting with each other over the throne. They did not care about the empire. They did not care about the people. They did not care about the disintegration that was going on inside the empire. 
all they wanted was the throne for themselves. Meanwhile, British took advantage of chaotic situation and started slowly penetrating in almost entire India. They slowly penetrated in the politics of India. Another reason behind the weakening of Mughal Empire was the demoralization of army. Along with the rulers, army also grew weary. We all know that army works well. Army defend the empire well when they are led by a good ruler, a passionate ruler. But we know at the time that there was no good leader. There was no one to motivate them to arouse a spirit of fighter in them. So they also grew weary and the empire weakened. Now we would study one of the prime reason behind the downfall of Muslim rule in India, that is arrival of British and uh, how British took over the throne from Muslims. So in 1583, Queen Elizabeth I dispatched the ship named Tiger to India to start trade relations. And then in 1614, British East India Company opened its first office in India. It was the era of Jahangir. Jahangir ruled from 1605 to 1628. We have studied it. So what were the factors that led to the arrival of British in India? It was the great opportunities of trade in India. They wanted to exploit the opportunities of trade in India. They wanted to compete with imperial European powers. We all know that at that time, imperialism was at its peak and there were many imperial powers. There was France, Dutch, Spain, and uh, all others. So they all wanted to compete with each other. So with the desire of competing with the rest of the imperial European powers, British came to India. They wanted to plunder immense wealth of India and they wanted to colonize and expand their empire. These all were the factors that led to the arrival of British in India that brought British to India. So how British started creeping into the politics of India? British actually enjoyed unique trading policies from Mughal emperors. They were granted free trading license, they continued seeking concessions from Mughal Empire and we know that uh, people of this area, people of subcontinent are very generous and um, they like giving concessions. So British started taking advantage of this generosity and simplicity of Mughal emperors. They started invasions from Bengal. They built Fort Williams in Kolkata with the permission of Mughal Empire and slowly they started gathering ammunition in Fort Williams. This was the plan of Britishers. Britishers were living a very good life in Bengal and uh, their plan was going very nicely but then a tragedy took place. A very miserable and gruesome tragedy called Black Hole Tragedy. It took place on June 20, 1756 so let's see what this tragedy was. British actually enjoyed many favors in Bengal. They did not pay any tax and they had a free trade license. But then the mind of Nawab of Bengal changed and he wanted to end such privileges and impose taxes on the British East India Company. British refused from paying any taxes. He also did not allow the reinforcement of Fort Williams. British people actually sought permission from the Nawab of Bengal to reinforce the fort and he did not allow that. Then the gathering of ammunition in Fort Williams further infuriated Nawab. Then he attacked Calcutta and imprisoned 146 Europeans in a dungeon of Fort Williams. Some people say that uh, these were 146, some say that uh, these were 64 and um, there are many accounts of history on this but uh, here we would believe that there were 146 Europeans. A person 
named John said that 123 of 146 people died in there due to suffocation and dehydration. John was the survivor of this uh, tragedy. The room was 14 feet wide and 18 feet long. This room was called Black Hole where 123 people died of suffocation and dehydration. It was called the Black Hole Tragedy. This incident infuriated Britishers and they vowed to avenge the Nawab for this cruelty. After the Black Hole Tragedy, Major Robert Clive and Admiral Warson were sent to take revenge from Nawab. But these Britishers were very clever. They did not start fighting at the outset, but they started arguments. They started arguments and they won free trade license from Nawab. After winning the license, they launched attack on Nawab. And Nawab lost the war owing to the treachery of his general Mir Jafar. Mir Jafar was bribed by the Britishers, he betrayed Nawab and he made Nawab lose the war. Mir Jafar was made the Nawab of Bengal then, but he was a mere pawn and he did not have any authority. After the Battle of Plassey, Bengal was in the hands of Britishers. So this is how Britishers won Bengal. After the Battle of Plassey, two more wars were fought against Britishers by the Bengalis because they wanted freedom from the Britishers and uh, indirectly Bengal was under the rule of Britishers after the Battle of Plassey. But the wars were won once again by the Britishers. These were War of Bidara that was fought in 1759 and War of Buxar in 1764. So War of Bidara was fought between Mir Jafar and Britishers. Mir Jafar ran away and Dutch and Britishers began to fight. Dutch were, were at the back of Mir Jafar at the time. Dutch lost the war and Mir Qasim was made the Nawab of Bengal. After that, War of Buxar was fought in 1764. Mir Qasim and Nawab of Awadh fought against East India Company. Because East India Company was using them as a pawn, all the decisions were in the hand of East India Company and um, everything was under control of East India Company. Mir Qasim was tired of it and he did not want any foreigner to rule on his land. So he launched war. But once again, they lost the war and British took over the Bengal finally and officially. Britishers then threw all the other European nations out of India and took control of almost half of the India. They became deeply enmeshed into the politics of India and stopped considering Mughals as the rulers of India. This was the start of Britishers taking the hold of India, taking the rule of India in their hand. Now we're going to start the most interesting and important part of this lecture that is War of Independence. War of Independence was the final crunch to Mughal Empire. It was fought by the locals against the Britishers to take back the freedom to take back the rule from the hands. Indians lost the war and uh, India was recognized as a colony of British Empire officially after that. So let's study the war of independence in a little detail. We're gonna start with the background of war. The year of 1857 was actually the year of eventual collapse of Mughal Empire. Locals got tired of Britishers' intervention in their affairs, in their political affairs. Therefore, they revolted. The war began from Meerut on May 1st, 1857. But Indians lost the war. And after this, India came under the direct rule of crown. India became official colony of British. After the War of Independence, India came under the direct rule of crown and East India Company was therefore abolished. Now we would study the causes of the War of Independence. 
But before starting these courses, I'd like to address CSS aspirants and uh, mention one thing here that whatever I explain from here on would be from the book Trek to Pakistan by Ahmed Said. Trek to Pakistan is the book that covers the Pakistan history from 1857 to 1947 and from here on whatever I explain whatever I teach here would be from this book and this book is also recommended by FPSC so it would be very helpful to you that I'm explaining this book here and it would be very beneficial for all the CSS aspirants so let's just start let's just study the causes of the war of independence the first cause explained by Ahmed Said in his book Track to Pakistan was military cause. Indian soldiers were actually subjected to discrimination. How? They were given 7 rupees per month while English were given 27 rupees per month. So isn't it unfair that the sons of that land were receiving only 7 rupees as their monthly salary and the invaders, the foreigners, were receiving more than twice. So this was unfair and it disgruntled Indian soldiers. Soldiers were not allowed to practice their religion. In 1806, six soldiers were ordered to not wear Safa and Tilak. They were persecuted religiously. There were no chances of promotion for Indian soldiers because the top brass of that army was British. So this was the cause, this was a major cause behind the war of independence. These Indian soldiers were agitated by the authoritative rule of British on, on their land, on the land of Indian people. So this is very disturbing and disheartening that this was happening in India at the time with the people of India. So another reason that caused war of independence was religious. And uh, Ahmed Said wrote in his book that it was the most important cause of revolt. Britishers actually came to India with an intention, with a mission of colonizing India and Christianizing India. They wanted Christian religion in India. They called Christian missionaries there to preach Christianity. R.D. Mangles, the chairman of the board of directors of the company, once stated in House of Commons in 1857 that Providence has bestowed upon us the empire of India so that the banner of Christ should wave triumphant from one end of the India to the other. This quote, I've taken this from the book track to Pakistan and you can make an idea, you can imagine here that how intense their desire was there, how intense the desire of Christianizing India was there in the heart of the Britishers. Another person, E. Edmund, declared in 1855 that since India had come under one government, it should also have only one religion. They wanted to eliminate all the other religions and um, we know that in India at the time there were many religions primarily it was under the rule of Muslims but there were Hindus there were Sikhs and uh, there were other religions also but Britishers they wanted to eliminate all the religions they wanted their Christianity and only Christianity so by the statements of these people you can make an idea that how how cunning these people were they came on the land of other people and they took hold of the, that land they colonized that land orphans were forcibly converted to christianity at the time so this was the most important cause of revolt there were political causes also behind the war of independence. Britishers actually used politics to take over India. They knew that the land of India has been ruled by Muslims for more than 300 years. 
and Muslims were ruling over Hindus also. So they distorted the image of Muslims and they maligned history. They presented Muslims as oppressors and Hindus as oppressed. They stopped giving respect to Mughals and inculcated the sense of inferiority in Mughals and the local people of India also. They inculcated a sense that they are inferior, uncivilized and Britishers are superior and civilized and Britishers are there to civilize them. So that's why they should give all the political authority in the hands of Britishers. This is the thing that Britishers were inculcating in Indians. And this is how Britishers took the hold from Mughals, from Indians, from everybody that was in India at the time. A decree was issued by Lord Delusi that after the death of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the heir would have to leave the Red Fort. Another cause behind the war was legislative. In India, there was Governor General and his Executive Council. The Executive Council used to perform dual duty. It used to make the law and it used to execute the law. Now the most unsatisfactory thing in this system was that there were no Indians in the committee to advise Governor General and to advise those people who were making the laws for Indians. In Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's booklet, as the causes of Indian rebellion, 1858, he mentioned that legislative was the main cause of that revolt. These Britishers were making and implementing laws for Indians when they did not even know about Indians. They never took their advice while they were making laws and executing laws. So this was the thing that was unsatisfactory that was not acceptable for the Indians. So these were the causes that caused war of independence, that caused the revolt, political cause, legislative cause and religious also and military also. Now another reason behind the war of independence is the accession of princely states. What the Britishers were doing in India was that they were annexing princely states with the British Empire. In 1840, Lord Delusi introduced doctrine of lapse. Now what this doctrine of lapse is? It states that if a prince of any princely states dies and does not have a male heir to inherit the princely state, the princely state would go to British Empire eventually. This was a plan, this was a strategy to expand the rule of British in India. It was a, a law introduced by Britishers to expand their rule, just to expand their rule. State of Awadh was added very ignominiously in 1856. Actually, State of Awadh was forcefully annexed by the Britishers. So this is how Britishers were taking control of almost entire the India. This was their strategy to colonize India. Two other causes behind the war of independence were cultural cause and the economic cause. Britishers actually did cultural invasion in India. They banned the rituals and traditions of Indian people and they looked at their culture satirically. They instilled in the mind of Indian people that they are inferior and the English are superior. They did not like their culture and as I've said it earlier that they looked at their culture satirically. Here on this image you can see that how Britishers are sitting in a cart and uh, instead of horse there are Indian people towing the cart. So this was very, very humiliating 
what it was happening at the time because India was under the rule of British Empire. So British Empire was authoritative enough to do anything it wanted to do in India. Now another cause that is economic cause. Doors of high post were barred for Indians. English exploited the resources of India. The local industry was ruined. When Britishers came to India, their share in global GDP was 25 to 35%. But by the end of independence, it was only 2%. So this was the extent to which English exploited and looted India. They were there just to loot the wealth of India and just to accumulate the wealth at their home. So this was the atrocities of English people in India. These were the main causes behind the war of independence. Now the immediate cause of the war that caused the bursting of all the anger inside the hearts of local people against the British masters. What was this immediate cause? It was the introduction of Enfield Rifle in India. But what's so important about this rifle that caused war? Actually, there is something very interesting and important about the cartridge of this rifle. The cartridge of this rifle was rumored to be greased with beef and pork. And the soldiers were required to tear open this cartridge with their teeth. And we all know that uh, if you are a Muslim, you are not allowed religiously to bite anything made of pork. And if you are a Hindu, it's not allowed religiously to bite anything made of beef or cow fat. So soldiers were compelled to do this. Soldiers were compelled to do something that was prohibited in their religion. So in April 1857, some soldiers at Meerut rejected to use this rifle. The company sentenced them to 10 years of imprisonment. The soldiers out of agitation revolted and in May, more soldiers joined them and the war began from Meerut. After the war, Mughal Empire was crushed completely and India became officially the colony of British. We all know that the war was a fiasco for Indians. They could not win the war against Britishers. So these all were the causes of the war of independence. We studied military cause, religious cause, political cause, legislative cause, and uh, the economic, cultural, and the immediate cause. It was very interesting. When I learned it in the Trek to Pakistan book, I, I was amazed. I, I, I enjoyed a lot. I was happy to gain all this knowledge. So whatever I taught here was from the book and uh, the rest of the material would all the rest of the material that I'm going to explain next would also from the book. So these all were the causes of Mo of the war of independence that was the eventual collapse to Mughal Empire. Now we would study the result of the war of independence. We all know that the war was a fiasco, a failure for locals. Locals lost the war. But what made them lose this war? What were the causes of the failure? Definitely there were causes and we would study these here. First of all, it was the change of plan that made locals lose the war. The war was started on May 1st, 1857, when it was planned to be started on May 31st. The war was started a month earlier than it was planned. So it made people, it made soldiers panic. They did not know what to do because they started a month earlier than they were supposed to start the war. They were disunited and there was no coordination so they could not fight very well. Second cause of the failure of war was treachery of Sikh community. Yes, it is very saddening to know that uh, all nations were not united at the time and there was 
disintegration among the nations and uh, Sikh community betrayed all the other people of Indians and uh, a person named W. Russell said that if all nations had joined hand against us we would have been completely annihilated despite all our courage and bravery. This is the statement that I have taken from the book Threat to Pakistan and uh, you can imagine here, you can make an idea that all nations were not united at the time. A person, an English person is saying it himself and um, Sikh community betrayed the people. Had the all nations joined hand against the Britishers, they would have been completely annihilated. Another reason behind the failure was that there was no leadership. The locals were fighting on their own and uh, they were not led by anybody. There was no leader. Bahadur Shah Zafar was very weak and uh, old at the time. He could not be a leader at the time. But I think that we should not blame his age here. I mean, Bahadur Shah Zafar in his entire life had never been a good warrior. Bahadur Shah Zafar was a person of poetic nature, a person who loved architecture and art like his ancestors, I mean his, his some of his ancestors, he was not a person of warrior nature. I mean even if he was young, he would never have, he could never have fought the war, he could never have been a good warrior, a good, uh, a good leader of an army. So we should not blame his age only, Bahadur Shah had never been a good leader of an army. Another reason was that there was lack of finances. All the treasury of government was in the hands of Britishers and the locals did not have any finances for war. Another reason was that there was no coordination among fighters. Some were fighting in Meerut, some were fighting in Delhi, some in Jhansi and uh, they did not know how to coordinate. These were not professional soldiers. These were just local people who revolted against their tyrannical masters. Their, they wanted to stood, stand up against the persecution. So they did not have any, they were not coordinated. Another reason was that poor and old equipment in the hands of locals. I've talked about it already that Britishers were in control of everything. They were the one in control of the finances and all the arsenals or the all the ammunitions. So locals did not have anything. They had poor and old equipment. They were fighting with these things. So it's not fair to think that these poor and old equipment could make them win the war. No, they could not win the war with these equipments. Another reason was companies' control over means of transportation and communication. Again, I would say the same thing that the government was of Britishers. Everything in India was under their control. The means of transportation and communication was in the control of Britishers. So, Indians could not communicate with each other. Indian fighters could not communicate and coordinate with each other. Robert Montgomery said India was saved by the electronic wire. He said this about the war of independence because the communication was in their, in their hands and local fighters could not communicate with each other at the time. So this thing made local fighters lose the war. So this was the result of war of independence. And uh, it is very saddening to know that the Indians lost the war and uh, Britishers won the war. Let's see what do we have more on this topic in the next slide. Now we would study the impacts of War of Independence 1857. And impacts are more saddening than anything else that we have studied so far. So the first impact, the first thing that Britishers did after the War of Independence was that they exiled Mughals and they killed Mughals. Those who once ruled the entire subcontinent, who once were the 
emperor of that great empire were killed and exiled. These were the people, Mughals were the people who established such a magnificent empire. But they came to a very bad end. Bahadur Shah Zafar was tried for treason, imprisoned and exiled to an area that is now called Myanmar. And there he died. India came underground after that. After war, Queen gave a proclamation, a proclamation of 1858 and took India under British rule. Took India directly under British rule. Before this, India was under the rule of East India Company. This rule was also the rule of the crown, but indirectly. There was a mediator between it who was East India Company. Now, East India Company was removed and India was the was under direct control of British rule and India became the official colony of British. East India Company was abolished then because East India Company had um, accomplished the task of uh, colonizing the India so it was abolished then. I mean it was not something in favor of Indians. East India Company had already done what it was supposed to do so they just abolished it. Doctrine of lapse was also abolished and British army was established in India permanently so that this kind of revolt does not take place one ever again. These were the impacts of war of independence and uh, let's see what do we have in the next slide. So the impact of war of independence continue here the positive impact of war of independence was that a constitutional and political development was started after this war a british crown started making constitution for india and there were some amendments also for example mintu mola reforms of uh, 1909 and um, indian act of 1882 i don't remember the dates exactly but uh, Constitutional and political development was started after this war. This is something that I know. Another positive impact was that after war of independence, the armed struggle was eliminated. It was the end of armed struggle and the start of political struggle. Many intellectual people joined politics after that and started working for the freedom of people, for the, for the independence of people. Then political leaders also came to the front. Uh, for example, Kadiasa Muhammad Ali Jinnah came to the front and many other leaders came to the front. Uh, some were from Hindu side, some were from Muslim sides, but these leaders came to the front. Then again, a negative impact that the war was a fiasco for Muslims. Muslims were accused of masterminding this, this war, this rebellion, and Britishers used to think, Britishers used to call Muslims the mastermind of this war. So they just, they started persecuting Muslims and uh, suppressing Muslims because they did not want any such revolt to take place again. They persecuted Muslim in every aspect of life, socially, politically, religiously, academically, everything. They barred all the doors for Muslims. So the war was a fiasco for Muslims. Another positive impact of war was that educational movements started after that. The most famous educational movement was the Ali Garh movement was Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. And uh, this was the positive impact of war of independence. So if we conclude, can we say that war of independence was a failure or war of independence was not a failure. I think we should do an analysis on this. War of independence was actually a failure, if I am to answer this question. Because the main aim, the main goal of the war was not achieved. The main goal was freedom from, from Britishers. 
but the freedom was not achieved. They were not free after this war. So we would call this war of independence a failure. But there were many positive things that took place after this war. After this war, constitutional and political development was started. After, after this war, many political leaders came to the front. Educational movements were started. And um, Muslims started improving their position by the help of these educational movements. But uh, in short, this war was undoubtedly a failure undoubtedly a failure so this is the end of this lecture and uh, i have explained almost everything this was a very interesting topic decline of muslim rule in india and uh, from css perspective this is very important also so to all the css aspirant memorize whatever i have explained here and again i would say that uh, Everything that I have written in this lecture, I have explained in this lecture, is from the book Trek to Pakistan, the part of War of Independence, actually. War of Independence was completely from Trek to Pakistan. So if any of you wants to read that book, read the, read this uh, War of Independence from the book, uh, can definitely read that. But uh, if you people do not want to read that, then don't worry. I've explained all the important things. In fact, more than important here. So there is no need for any of you to go to the book and uh, read that personally. This is enough for CSS aspirants. Uh, for today, I think this is enough. And uh, best of luck for your exam. Uh, work hard and study hard. And uh, Allah Hafiz. Till ne next lecture.